Yo, what's up? This is your boy DJ 10th Power here in the Lion's Den. I'm here with episode number two of my conversation with Jill Jones. But before we get into that, let me thank her for episode one. Yo, she has some funny stories. I know you agree with me. I also want to thank our producers, Angry Bull Productions, for putting that together for us and all three episodes as well. If you like the previous episode or any of our episodes or dislike them or want to comment or want to be interviewed on our show, hit me up at the QI Podcast at gmail.com. You can also hit me up on our social media, which is Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the QI Podcast. Now on to episode number two. So, okay. I became a big Prince fan from the Controversy album. I've always Great been album. this 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 kid that loved music and politics and mm -hmm. messages that were being sent, you know, big on Stevie Wonder, Prince, people like that. And uh, Ronnie Talk to Russia is probably one of my all-time favorites by him. And um, so when 1999 came around and uh, we, me and my brothers, we had to beg our parents to finally get some cable TV where <laughs> we could get uh, MTV. Right. And, you know, at that time, not too many black artists were being played. At before. all, yeah. At all. Sure. But when we saw the 1999 video come on, <laughs> and we saw this platinum blonde woman, we were like, holy cow, who is this red bone? It was, and yeah, red bone, I, I, for I sure. I really fell in love with the song because, you know, radio out in New York at the time, they were playing 1999 and DMSR back to back. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, I was all over it. I was just waiting for the album to actually drop on vinyl so I could get on it. And back then, of course, we read cover to cover, the lyrics, the credits and everything. So it became who is, who is, which one is JJ, you know? <laughs> and that wound up being you. Yeah. So it I was, know that I you sung on 1999 and, and Free. Were there any other songs on, on that particular album that you sung on? Lady cab driver little red car automatic i sang on i saw that um, video just two weeks ago i didn't even know there was a video for that oh yeah but they wouldn't play it nah. you know it's so <laughs> funny uh, we had a situation with this tipper gore had this really weird group called the moral majority <laughs> and it was a bunch of <laughs> washington women ironically democrat women very uptight so for the Democrats to be that uptight, imagine how tight the Republicans were during that time, because right, that exactly. was with, you know, Ronald Reagan and all those people. Or, but anyway, so she got every, all of, a lot of our stuff banned, and, you know, didn't, or stickers. We, it started with the stickers. And so Automatic, for some reason, with, um, on MTV, it, that one was not that would or it would be shown after dark mm, i guess right. your parents didn't let you stay you, they got you cable, no, but no, i like, had school the next day so i couldn't you know yeah certain time the tv had to be cut off yeah so that was that was it and um and it, it's funny because i mean when you think about it our videos primarily were just performance videos we weren't doing stories or sexy stories but the uh, pushback and the, and the response was crazy. It's almost like we used to be like, what's in their minds that's not really in our minds? Because we're just doing a performance video. But for some reason, the presence was just to, Prince's presence was, was a towering presence. And, you know, it kind of commanded something from them a lot of viewers in that world they weren't ready for it other musicians got it easily mm -hmm. but like white america was struggling and trying to fight the fact that yeah you did have these red bones and black folks on there because we were other than michael jackson who almost had to do the whole disney route to get accepted right. you know i'm a nice black guy um, you know, so <laughs> I'm nice and cuddly like a bear uh, or a toy or something, you know. Um, there's Prince who's like, I'm going to have all your daughters, you know, <laughs> you know, like I could if I want to. 
there was a sexual energy and I think that for people to see black men and black women with that it it threatened some people so mm -hmm. that's what that was about that whole uh, I guess they didn't like the aggressiveness of, of, of it all I guess is the word that they would call it I don't know yeah but I mean it's so funny they thought that Prince was so aggressive that way but he was a smooth little talker and and could mirror some he could get other people to mirror the better part of themselves if he wanted to at a concert which is why I think he earned such a valuable reputation and a really respected reputation as performing because he gave it all he got but he also really could read his room that was a, a good point he could always read a room mm -hmm. of his you know and I think all musicians need to know that when you have a, a catalog of a few songs some nights it's not going to work and right. other nights you've got to really know and look around and go okay no we're not doing that one and um, <laughs> So. Now, was it during this during this time that uh, you and Prince had also started a, a relationship? Yeah, if you could call it that. I mean, we I was one of the many relationships, I suppose, that he had ongoing. I think that, you know, his relationships were part and parcel to the creativity and to proximity of being there. But I also believe that he decided who he wanted to be there a lot of the times. And that I think that it was never like a rash decision. Just it, It's just that when you're connecting musically, I think on a creative level, on anything, you know, people get close to each other. It's sort of a gypsy lifestyle anyway. You know, you're there and... You're writing a song or you feel really good about somebody at that moment same as in film or any acting or any of that right it's easy to transfer your thoughts now clearly um, he was he was feeling you because she's always in my hair was yeah. um i remember the brothers used to blast that on the block like it wasn't a b-side and really? today you, you you call that you call that woman your ride or die yeah. Back then he called it She's Always In My Hair But you know this was a, a very deep song Complimentary song about yourself It was It was and you know I, I took it in a way of I think I was pretty gobsmacked about that song But I still didn't understand You know sort of hit home with me With somebody saying Maybe I'll marry her and maybe I won't And I, I Just my own personal thing was Feeling that Wow, I mean, he gets to decide or do I get to decide? <laughs> I'm the girl. I should, you know, um, so those, but the song was deep and it was, and it was so strange because <clears throat> a lot of people love that song, but he did put it on the B side and it just became, I mean, he played that all the way through his life. Mm -hmm. And I really do think he enjoyed playing it to the very end. I've I seen have, concerts where he's played it. Exactly. I, I was about to say that I have a few DVDs of his concert where he, he, he rips it to shreds. And yeah, the riff was just ridiculous, though. Mm -hmm. I was, like, not going to give him that at first, but I was like, yeah, I mean, it's pretty badass. And it got to the point where when you would buy a, a Prince 7-inch single or a 12-inch, uh, you had to at least explore the B-side because... You were getting good product there too. I mean, she's always in my hair. Erotic City was Erotic a City. I love mm -hmm. you in me. Uh, irresistible. Yeah. I mean, these these were dance floor cuts. And, classics. You know, and that's funny because his managers would argue make this a single. Mm -hmm. But I think what he was creating was the need for that vinyl, the the need to get that and go and get the single. But he wasn't just going to give you a throwaway B side. Mm -hmm. He really gave up some really high level, uh, each one was different because uh, Irresistible wasn't going to be a single because it wouldn't have ever made radio without a bunch of doop, 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 or whatever right. edits or, um, and it's the same. So he made it where you were like a voyeur into this other part of his psyche, mm -hmm. which I think the fans particularly enjoyed going there.
Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me, I I would literally have to buy both the seven inch single and the twelve inch exactly. because a song like Erotic City or She's Always in My Hair or what have you, you had to get the extended version, especially like me, because I'm a DJ. So yeah. you had to get that extended version. You had oh, to. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, he put as much care into those B-sides. They were never just haphazardly put together. Or even when we did the extension on Kiss, and he and I were, I mean, I'm sure it wouldn't be politically correct today where we were Saul and um, the the two old people at the end yelling at each other and arguing. That was you? Uh huh. That was me and him. Say what? All this time I thought it was Wendy. No, it was me and him. Hey, you heard it here first. Oh wow, that was your yeah. Oh, Saul, what are you doing, Saul? And That's it was crazy. just yeah, which um is wild. So now he's sitting down and he's he's brainstorming the idea for Purple Rain, <laughs> and um, you know y'all are filming the movie now. Just hitting the first scene, if like me, I'm in that seat in the theater, you know, just shaking, like ready for it to jump off. And it hits you from the first scene. If was the set like that, like was the people like just on fire crazy, and you had to literally calm people down just to get the scenes done? Yeah, I mean, it no, at the point he was on the brink of, you know, he had some popularity and, um, it was really weird how they got everyone wanted to participate in it. He always just sort of drew a crowd. He just had the magnetism. And there was so much buzz in the city about this. And people were rooting for him in, the, in Minneapolis. It was when Minneapolis had a good vibe, mm -hmm. you know, where all there was so much diversity at the time. And that film really helped bring a lot of people together. Because even though Minneapolis essentially has never been not racist, <laughs> that it didn't exist, there was still pockets that, that those guys, all of them, Andre, Des, Prince, and their, their workmanship, and Jimmy and Terry, sort of forged a city that they could see themselves in, and they were very prominent in it. Mm -hmm. And... Other people could see themselves in it, and there was community outreach, and there was this wonderful esteem that was being built for, you know, black people in their communities. There was a Native American, uh, indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, over time, it looks like it's an image, especially with him gone, and most of the guys now, Andre and everybody, they don't live there anymore. They have their friends who are there, but it's like these guys were sort of beacons to keep, like, the aspirational aspect of what the city could be. Um, <clears throat> that was the time when Minneapolis was calling itself the Minneapolis. But these guys, with the fans checking out the bands and all these, but it was sort of a, the world just, they just sort of blended. Bands would come. So the the town itself was always receptive to new music and new artists. I saw U2 there um, before they were really anything, and everybody just, you know. Did you enjoy, uh, did you join them on the, the Purple Rain tour as well? As no, the I wasn't on the Purple Rain tour, just 1999. Okay. Was that a decision that you made yourself, you wanted to get Yeah, in? I had gone back to school a little bit, and I, and he and I weren't really getting along at that point. We had a we had some issues, but we weren't really, like, vibing. And I think that, you know, that's, I think there was a little bit of autonomy, maybe, that he was right on the precipice. I mean, he was at the very tip top of his game from the movie. Then mm -hmm. there's this, and there was sort of a shift in, in, in people. You know, Vanity had left, and yeah. um, that project was in a different state. Apollonia 6 wasn't really going to move much further than that. Um, he tried to put, you know, he did the albums and all this stuff, but I think it was just a time where he was also trying to focus on his stuff, and then he had Sheila, and yeah, more business started. It started to expand a little bit more to the outside world, whereas before, it was sort of very, there was a nucleus but after 
he became famous in the movie, it just started to expand out. Okay. So what brought you back? Well, I was always around and always singing on something because he would fly in from those tours. People, you know, he wasn't solidly ever out on any tour. And if he was, he'd go to studios there and record. And, you know, you could always be doing some work. So, yeah, that was, that didn't really change. I just was like involved in a lot of other stuff and writing and thinking about the new, the record that I wanted to do. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, the album that you wound up putting out on Paisley came much later? It did. How much it later? It all got delayed. Because, you know, it's funny, over those years, we did things like that were more bubblegummy and just really wasn't me, you know? I had moved to New York. I was, you know, Prince was very like, oh, why don't you move to New York? I was sculpturing, doing all this shit. And, um, <laughs> Really interesting things. Art scene, you know. What did you uh, think the of The best York? artist in the whole group of all of us truly was Vanity. She was an incredible artist. Draw, really? She could draw her eyes off. Like, yeah, she she actually had that hands down. Now, I read but, an article um, where you had said the, re the band The Revolution mm -hmm. was like a Milli Vanilli Damn to you. I think. Yeah, and I said that they were like a, that it was like a plantation. I think, um, you know, in those days, oh, this is tricky. The Millie Vanilli part came into, I think, as he became more famous and was writing songs. I think you'll you will see, and a lot of people have seen where. Now, all of a sudden, everybody was writing songs with him. Everybody was doing this. And there were a few that definitely have grudges that they can stand behind, and they had issues with Prince over certain things. And I would not take that away from them. But Prince and his concept of the revolution and everything else started during 1999, when he was pretty much alone after Andre left. It was a new, like turning a new page in what he was going to do with you know his world it was a transformation and he also had an incredible intention in his head and manifestation of what he was going to do he was not going to write an album that was going to go on the black charts to sell to go gold to have to cross over to the white charts because that's how it was in those days he was not going to do that and i think that a lot of people forget um, not to be slight anybody, but there wasn't that much leeway for anybody to be coming up with riffs and stuff at that time. I and mean, what was Wendy, 18? She could barely play the guitar. She could play the guitar, but with his guidance. And I guess I'm from an older school, an older model of living with a Tina that if you're allowed to be in the room to eat with the adults or the people who have the most experience, I was never the kind of person who'd immediately be, well, I know I did that, you know. Right. I never was like that. So maybe I was wrong for projecting that on them. But there really wasn't anything that wasn't something that he create, didn't create. Mm -hmm. Whether it was, I also came from a musical family and I know that when people are on a payroll, you got to be careful with your rehearsals because even if you're working a job in a corporation, if you are on their computer and you write a book, Technically, it doesn't belong to you. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with when you're rehearsing with bandmates and people need to learn early on from the get, hey, is this on the record or off the record? Because if we're creating something and we are a legitimate band, a legitimate band to me was always somebody who carried the same burden as you. Mm -hmm. not, not someone who you have the record deal you have the nut, and you're paying them a salary. That makes no sense to me. It just doesn't. So mm -hmm. it was his band. And, and I think he, he was quite generous to a lot of those people. Now, maybe the African-American people, I don't think he was as generous to. But I don't know why he was a little bit kinder to some of the other ones. Okay. 
because I think there's a political, there was always a political game. It's just like having me look white, you know, to do that. Blonde hair. I wasn't. You know, real people on the real knew that I was told, you said red bone right away. Mm -hmm. People who we know, other people didn't know. They're like, oh, there's like, well, he's got all these white people in his band. Didn't I mean there to a degree? I did hear that in the interview that I, I forgot who who you sat with, and and they had mentioned that the same video and that they were like, "Who is this white girl?" And I'm like, "They saw you as a white girl. We we never saw that." <laughs> he he knew that the black community wouldn't see that because after Purple Rain, he goes, "The black community." He goes, "Our people are gonna love you." Mm -hmm. I was like, "I'm hardly in the movie." He's like, he goes. He goes, the brothers, they're going to like you. Mm -hmm. He was right. <laughs> he told me that, I swear to God. I think there was a part of calculation. And the Millie Vanilli part came from, I guess after he died, I was a little bit kind of like saddened that everybody was, you know, picked up and said, let's go on tour. Like what they did to RBG it was like, okay, let's get voting. You know, I was like, oh, <clears throat> I don't do well with stuff like that. Right. And I think that, yeah, maybe that was my issue as well, but also really wanting to make sure people knew what he really did, like how masterful and how talented he really, really was. He didn't even need any of us to be there. We were just foils of what he needed. You know, this kid had so much music that he had to create all these different bands as an outlet. I mean, really, he did. He had so many different styles. And, you know, in the music business, they don't like you to have a lot of different styles. Right. They want to pigeonhole you. Yeah, which is why my record didn't do so well either. We talked about that, too. You're going to do jazz, or are you going to do this, or are you going to do, you know, uh, dancey music? I was like, I want to do everything. And he was like, it doesn't work. But he, and, he, and it's true, it doesn't. Because they want you one way. Right. And he was really good at figuring out how to thread the needle he figured that out and so I just kind of don't want everyone to take that away from him he worked just hard night and day and uh, I think that music was his first love and it was the that was the one thing for him so Mia Boca mm-hmm how did that come about? We were in the house on Kiowa Trail. Um, <laughs> we just were goofing around in the studio and I don't know, we had ordered some Italian food or picked up some from somewhere. But we, we always watched a lot of um, movies and I think we'd watch Swept Away, the Italian version. I vaguely remember it was maybe that film. He just kind of got into the whole cinema and drama and he always thought I was completely dramatic in every explanation and what was going on and you know if I was mad it was super dramatic or whatever. So yeah, Mia Boko we wrote and he started he started the lyric and then and the next thing I know I'm on the phone calling these Italian restaurants asking him, how do you say this in Italian? We'd write the word, how do you say this? Well, the thing was, we weren't getting the Italian owners. We were getting the Spanish guys who worked in the kitchen. <laughs> so that's why when I finally released that song and I was in Italy, everyone's like, your grandma, Jew, is terrible. It's like, I was like, well, you get the gist of it. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Now, my, my joint was, is blue violet. Uh, I violet love blue. Violet blue. The yeah, beginning thanks. of it. I, I just, just, just the beginning of it. I had to keep playing that. Just, you know, it just took me a minute just to get past that. Because as a, as a producer and a DJ, you want to sample that. You know, you could chop that up and mm -hmm. do so many things with it. But, um, but then I sat and I listened to the the entire song and was just blown away. What actually inspired that that song as well? Um. That song came about when he was seeing, um, it was kind of a triangular situation. He was, I think, out with Susanna, and um, that relationship was kind of happening, and they were supposed to be engaged, and then he and I were 
kind of on the outs, but we also were working together. And I had a journal, and I always shared stuff with him in my journal, things that I'd written that were, and it was just like triangles. I've never really cared for them. And I think I was kind of mentioning that. And he had seen uh, Liz Taylor like around that time as well, I believe. So there was a lot going on, and he was like, you know, your eyes sometimes change colors, and they almost look like, you know, like a violet -y color on gray, gray days. And also, it, yeah, when I was younger, I guess, yeah, it could, and with that hair. But um, uh, he wrote part of that. He wrote it uh, based upon, I guess, the what he saw, what I was writing, what he was feeling, but I think he mainly wrote it coming from a perspective of having being in a triangle and there's two people and I am not I don't have the hubris or the arrogance to say that it was anything specific about his feelings towards me or her or all of us I can only just put the associations together Mm -hmm. And know that even doing the song, and it was a specific song that he really, because most of the album, a lot of it, I did with um, David Z. And when he started writing it, we were in the studio, he's like, do you like this? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, okay, I'll call you later. And then I went home. And then I got a call like around, I don't know, the middle of the night or something yeah. to come back to the studio and he specifically wanted to record that one, like himself. And that's really how, what that was, that it meant something for him to rec be the one to record that song. There was a lot of poignancy in it. And I remember there was a lot of dead space with us in the studio that day. Just a lot of, because we really hadn't been around each other in a little bit and he was dating her, I was dating other people, so it was really um, kind of a really weird thing, like how are we going to proceed in this relationship, you know, so it was almost as if like he put himself in my position, but he had an insight to himself in the song, which was, is kind of bizarre, that's why it's such a brilliant song. And yo, that just about does it for episode two of my conversation with Jill Jones. We want to thank her for giving us her time, her precious time, because she's into a lot of different things. And I also want to thank my producers, Angry Bull Productions. Again, hit us up on our social media, theqipodcast.com, or you can email us at theqipodcast at gmail.com. I am your host, DJ Tenth Power, signing off until episode number three of my conversation with Jill Jones. Peace.